Going to be work, she's been working with stakeholders and the high street experts in establishing LISCAR Together Partnership. So we're going to talk about learnings from that and how to create better place partnerships. So yeah. welcome to the, the talking table, as I'm now calling it. <laughs> no, thanks uh, for having me. So LISCAR, there's obviously two of them. So people might know the one in Cornwall. So tell us about LISCAR in the world. What's, what's it like? What are the challenges and opportunities? So this card is a kind of stereotypical 1960s town centre. Um, it's a key town centre in the council's local plan um, and it's also identified as a regeneration priority area. But there are a number of challenges. Um, the area suffers from sort of socio-economic deprivation. Um, there are sort of fairly significant vacancy rates. There are a number of retailers who've left, you know, we've lost Wilco's, we've lost Hogwarts, and um, we've struggled to get retailers back in. Um, there's also a kind of very limited nighttime economy. So at night time, you know, it's just inactive frontages, some antisocial behaviour, which I'm sure these are challenges that you'll all be familiar with. So that's kind of where, where we were. And I think the, the local plan and the regeneration priority gives a platform to develop a master plan that sets out a real vision for the area and kind of what, what we wanted to see. And that helps shape kind of the process going forward. So in terms of actually deciding to bring together placemakers and interested people, what, what drove the need to put in place a partnership? What, was, what started that journey about putting the partnership together? I think we had, um, as I mentioned, we developed this master plan which sets out a long-term vision for the area and is predicated on large-scale capital investment, really, that's physical change in the town centre. But we recognise that it's not just about bricks and mortar, but you know, we need to make sure that we've engaged with the local businesses, um, with local community groups. And through the master plan process, we engaged with a lot of those people and it became apparent there was a real kind of sense of community, but we just weren't quite there. We just didn't have those networks, we didn't have those connections. We wanted to make sure that they would benefit from growth and it wasn't just kind of us dictating what would happen in the town centre. So I think we, we knew we needed something, but we didn't know how to coalesce those people and get them together. So what helped you coalesce and bring it together? Was that it was a role for the task force expert then? Yeah, no, certainly I think, um, you know, we were at a place where we, we knew we wanted to do something and it was very timely that we were offered the support from the High Street Task Force. Um, so we first had our Unlocking Your Place Potential workshop with Dan and Cunningham. That was early last year, February. Um, we were still in kind of COVID restrictions so that, that took place online. Um, and that was really helpful because it just got everyone in the virtual room and we highlighted the key challenges, the strengths, the opportunities of this card. Um, and Diane, through her kind of support, identified there was a real need for place activation, that we had these plans for the long term and we were hoping to secure funding to deliver that. But there was a need to do some short term interventions to activate the place and to bring people together. And that really helped focus that. Um, and then we receive subsequent support through the expert solution from Sonia Cabrillo and that again got, we were able to get people in a physical room which did really help um, later that year and there was a real buzz about the place you could sense that people were excited they saw the potential they felt that this was an opportunity for this squad for the first time in the entire really um, and it helped I think as a council it helped us to crystallise what, what we needed to do and how we could do it and I think without the high street task force we just wouldn't have had that direction and kind of Guidance. Brilliant. Good, good, good to know. Um, Sonia's with us today. Yeah, we, she's speaking later, so I'm sure if any of you, today is about networking. It's not, again, it's not what you hear up here, it's what you learn in the room and at lunch. And so please, please form an orderly queue to speak to Sonia, Sonia later. Um, I mean, it's, it's just an interesting reflection. There's, there's a number of things the task force could talk about, but we found that proper partnership proper place-based partnerships are missing in up to 60% of places, which is why after the Understanding Your Place Potential workshop, more often than not, the majority of cases we've reckoned, not we've, the experts have recommended mentoring support. So it's not about solving a specific problem, it's about building capacity and putting in place structures. So the actual structure of your board, what, what does that look like in terms of, you know, who's on it, how big is it, what's the representation of the council, etc. Yeah, so we, we had a challenge in that when we started this process, we were in the pre-election period. So I think what we would have done 
that not in the place, we were going to establish the board first and then the subgroups, which I'll come on to. Um, we had to do things a little bit back to front, but I actually think that's probably the beneficial, which I, I'll come on to. So, so the board itself, um, there's about 10 members on there, so that comprises um, elected members for this hard board um, and kind of senior representatives from the likes of the Chamber of Commerce. We've got a head teacher from the local primary school, um, health. Um, and the chairs of the subgroups. So beneath the board are three kind of action focused subgroups. We've got one that's focused on place, and that's um, a number of council officers, so myself um, in new generation. We've got planning, highways, licensing, as well as <coughs> key partners in the police. Um, and that's kind of <coughs> their remit is focused on place activation, but things like, um, you know, if we want to run events, logistically, how we can do it, any. Um, planting, highways, street scene improvements, things like that. Um, we've got people subgroup, which is focused on community. Um, so we've got a range of representatives from the CDF sector on there, and that's chaired by a local um, CIC who are quite active in this scar. Um, and then finally, we have a economy subgroup, which is focused on businesses. So that's chaired by the manager of the Primark, who's brilliant. Um, and that's getting local businesses together and traders to have those conversations and, and the way things work is we've got the, the subgroups which meet every six weeks and they're very much action focused so they have an action log uh, we have leads for each individual item the role of the board they meet the same four times a year but I think it's been beneficial for them to meet a bit more regularly at first when they're starting off and um, their role is more strategic and it's kind of they take they give us that strategic direction and we can escalate any issues, any risks, um, and also their influence can kind of lever in additional support. So for example, we, um, we were trying to secure the Labour Christmas lights, which is always an issue, um, and we were able to do one of the members of the board who's um, a CEO of a local business, and they able to make a contribution. It's, it's that mechanism of having that kind of strategic influence, but keeping the subgroups really focused on delivery. Brilliant. I mean, that's really quite sophisticated and quite evolved, I can humbly suggest, um, which might sound a little bit intimidating to some other people who might be in the audience who haven't even taken the first uh, first step on that journey. Um, so is there anything you would have done differently? Any missteps along the way? I think, um, I think it was challenging to get people on board. Um, I think we, we started the process through trying to get um, interested people into the different subgroups and to kind of get ideas on what they wanted to see in the town centre. I think the challenge we had was trying to get board members to take that strategic role and I think that's something that we're still working on so when I describe it I don't think we're quite there yet I think it's still a process and I think that we still need to prove that we're delivering things that's beneficial to people so that, that encourages them to get involved I think there is always an element of cynicism of, oh, is this just another board? Is it another talking shop? I, I haven't got an hour to spare, I have time. And, and it's, I think as time's gone on, we're getting that credibility and that proof of delivery that will encourage, hopefully, people to come on board. Yeah, and that, that's really interesting. Let, let's restate, these, these things are pilots. They're, you are the I think, sandbox, you know, we're playing. And from a policy point of view, this is being played with to see what works and what doesn't work. And I think, and I, and I know Lucy and her team are, you know, can be quite intimidating, these sort of civil servants in London, but they're not, they're lovely people who are always eager to learn and listen. And, uh, and it, you know, it might be, well, we could do more if you'd allow us to do that. So if there was, is there anything that, anything you'd like to do more of, but you can't because there's a blocker or anything? I think that, a major challenge is resourcing. So I think at the start of the process we probably didn't quite appreciate how much how time consuming it can be as a local authority to enable these things. And uh, because especially when you're starting off this process, you've got people who are interested in, but getting people to commit to taking on an action and really driving it through is, is quite challenging. So we we kind of we want to help that and try and get the, the partnership in a place where it becomes a bit more self-sustaining. But I think what we did, we in hindsight, I think we, we would have resourced it from the start, but what, what we identified was that in-house we didn't have sufficient resource 
Um, we don't have a designated town centre team. Um, so we did um, procure some external support, which I would say is, that is an opportunity for you to do this funding potentially. I don't think they confine the, of the funding, but um, if you identify, you know, I think it would be really worthwhile to see how much resource you have in house and if there is a gap to see how you can address that. Um, and I think one of the key things for, for us as a council that's really important is getting that senior buy-in. In Wirral, we have a number of town centres. Uh, Liscard is one in our kind of regeneration area, so it's a priority. But in local authority, there is always that kind of competing priorities and, and elected members from different wards, why are you prioritising this area? Um, and also from senior leadership in other departments, so for example, highways, if it, if it throws up something that they need to deal with, it has cost implications. And I think it's really important from the outset to get that buy-in from everyone. So we're all committed to this area. We want to invest in this area and prioritise it because you kind of can't prioritise everywhere because there's just not enough resource to do so. so. And that means you don't come up against those challenges if you want to bring something forward and they say, well, why are we doing it in this area? You've already got that. Yeah. And that's really interesting. So it's almost an investment of your time and capacity to grow your own time and capacity by empowering other people to do things you want them to yeah. do. You know, it's like, you know, work, there's of, I'm a boss and boss, I'm really, really busy, can't have an assistant. And you give somebody an assistant, and then they're 50% more busy because they're doing their job and they're having to train somebody else to do their job as well. And it's a bit like this, if you want to empower, you know, and I've met some great people who, you know, put their hands up to be here today, who are, <coughs> I won't name any names, but some very impressive, uh, local leaders who are here like, I don't know much about this and you know, I'm here to learn. And to invest in them, it is an investment. You're investing your time, your capacity as a local leader to empower these non-local authority people to actually pick up the reins and make this change happen. So you, you almost go backwards to go forwards a bit in terms of capacity, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's interesting, the idea of using some of this money to invest in short-term capacity building. That's a, that's a really interesting uh, takeaway. I mean, there's, I think there's a long term, you know, this is a short term program. Um, so I think there's an interesting challenge about the long term funding of these um, partnerships. Have you given much thought to that? I mean, we, we've, we've been fortunate in that we've secured some UK shared prosperity funding, which can take us through to March 2025. Uh, and we can use some of that funding to enable some of the, the actions and the interventions coming out of the kind of sub group action plans. But I think you're right, Key, we haven't identified a budget beyond that to, to support it. And so we are exploring ways, and part of the kind of capacity building piece you mentioned is to look at ways in which they become more self sustaining. So the board at the moment isn't constituted. You know, whether it will become constituted, whether that's a breakdown, we will review that. Um, so at the moment they can't hold funds themselves, so the council has that role as the accountable body. But moving forward, you know, if they can get themselves into a position where they can actually bid for funding, manage funding, it gives them that autonomy as well and kind of allows the council to step away a bit and that, then do their thing. Yeah, that sounds like a win-win or -win whatever. Yeah. So you mentioned your wish list of uh, things to do whilst the Shared Prosperity Fund is still there. So what do they look like? So um, having the three subgroups is really helpful because we can focus on different areas and it means that the people that come to those are interested in those areas so they don't have to sit through an hour long meeting or something that isn't relevant to them. So the, place, so the way it works, for each place, each subgroup develops some actions but there are linkages between the three. So place, we've um, done some street, you know, street scene audits to see what needs improving, we've done empty property audits um, and that's all and then looking at kind of ways in which we can enhance green infrastructure so that all that evidence will kind of evolve into a list of priorities to see what we need to do within the town centre. The community and economy groups are looking more at events. So we delivered a youth market in July, which through um, Joe Barra and Teenage Market, which was really, really successful. So that drove um, Fort Ford into the town centre. We had really positive feedback from both the, the traders the young people themselves that took part and people that attended. It was just an all-round really positive experience that we definitely, you know, say it's definitely worth looking into if that's something we'd like to explore. Um, the business group arranged the High Street Awards, which was, again, very small scale. Um, and I think that's the thing to, to mention, that 
you kind of got to be quite realistic with your ambitions. So you can have these kind of, wow, we'll do this, that, and the other, but you've got to say, well, realistically, let's keep it small for now. And it doesn't take much money. You can do things that are quite, you know, cost effective, but they do have an impact. And it's kind of don't be too ambitious, think, well, what can we do now? But then maybe next year we can build this up and do something a bit more, um, you know, large scale, but for now we'll just do it small. Because what, what I realised with the process is the things that mean a lot to people don't need to be kind of showy and huge interventions. It can be something really simple. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. You should, you should have mentioned that. We were, we were trying and maybe at a future event, there's a, there's a lady called Claire Richmond who's written a book called The Scavenger Mindset, which is sort of influenced my thinking and some other people in the room. It's about how to do more with less. And this isn't a you know, taking the mickey thing. It's like sometimes the absence of money and the absence of big pots of money can actually invigorate people just to get on with stuff. Mm -hmm. with, with money comes great responsibility to paraphrase you and um, you know, it's, so actually sometimes just getting on and doing stuff. And that's again a learning from the task force is again about 60% of places don't have an activation policy. You know? So they sit around thinking, when we get ourselves sorted, we'll do that big thing. Mm -hmm. No, what happens, what matters to people locally is things immediately, in their immediacy, and getting on and doing stuff. So it's really encouraging. So I don't think it's a lack of ambition to say, do the simple things first and build from there. I think it's actually foundational to the sort of interventions that people in this room will be, is just get some wins under your belt, get some stuff done and build from there. Um, super important. Well, I think, um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been, I've learned stuff talking to you as well, and I'm sure um, some some of the team in the audience will have learned things as well. So, uh, if we put our hands together, please, for Hannah.